What's going on engineers? In this video, we're going to be discussing and then implementing one of the most widely used, popular and efficient data structures there are, the hash table. Now, the reason we're doing the implementation in C today is because C is one of the few languages that don't have any kind of hash table built into the language itself. If you need that data structure, you have to sort of build it from scratch. And that's kind of what we'll do today. Many other languages bake hash tables right into their languages. So for instance, if you've ever used JavaScript object or C++ unordered map or a Java hash map, a PHP associative array, a Ruby hash, or even a Python dictionary, each time you've done so, you've actually been using a hash table internally. So first, what is a hash table? A hash table at its most basic function is an efficient way to store a value by key and retrieve a value by key. And when I say efficiently, what I mean is it should be able to store and retrieve values at the same speed, whether it's one item or 10 million items. And the way it does this efficiently is by pre-allocating a number of rows. So for instance, maybe it pre-allocates 10,000 rows. Rows can also be called slots or buckets. You'll hear different terminology depending on where you look. And then what you do is you take a given key and then you take a hash of that key. And if you have 10,000 rows, then what you want is you want to obtain a hash from a key that is somewhere in the range of 0 to 9,999. And by doing this, you can just immediately jump to the right slot in the hash table to find a given value. A hash table can kind of be visualized as a grid with two columns and some number of rows. And that some number of rows could be predefined or it could dynamically shrink or expand as the key count you know, grows or shrinks. In the first column would be the slot number. So it would just go in order one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to whatever your max table size is. And then the second column is going to be the values that are stored there, or more specifically, the key value pairs that are stored there. If things are still a little fuzzy, don't worry. We're gonna implement every little piece of what I just said, and we'll be able to visualize the actual table as we go, and it'll start making more sense. So let's jump into some examples. The first thing we have to do is define our table size. And I've picked 100,000 for this first example, but as this video goes on, we're gonna shrink and grow that just to look at a couple different things. The reason the table size is important is because it kind of represents the max number of items you can store in a hash table before you get what's called a collision. And a collision occurs when you have two keys that are different, but they hash to the same slot in the table. Now a hash table can and will support this scenario. It just means that at a given slot, there's two values. So what it does is it checks the first key. And then if that's the key it needs, it just takes the value. If it's not the key it needs, it moves to the next value there. And then if that's the right key, then it takes that one. So our next step is to make our actual hash function. Now there's tons of ways to make a hash function. You don't have to do it exactly if I've done it, but there is one thing that must happen with your hash function is it must return a value that is between zero and your hash table size minus one. The way I've accomplished this is by doing value mod table size. This guarantees me a value that is greater than or equal to zero, but also less than table size. This value is what allows us to jump directly to a given slot in the table and either store a value or retrieve a value by key. We could test this by supplying a key and seeing what decimal we get. When we come over here and we run it, we can see that we get 3846. That's gonna be the slot where that key is going to go. Now the thing about a hash function is that it's not random. It's gonna be 3846 no matter how many times we run this. You can see that it's always 3846. And this is important because when you go to retrieve a value with a given key, you need to be able to go to the exact same slot that it was stored in. And by using a deterministic hash function, you can achieve exactly this. Now it's important to note that if I lower the table size down to say 10, and then I rerun this again, you can see that now I get a new slot of six. Now that we have our hash function, next thing we need to do is introduce two structures into our code. One's gonna represent the hash table itself, and one's gonna represent one entry in the hash table. Our hash table itself is nothing more than an array of pointers to an entry. And our entry is nothing more than a key, a value, and a pointer to another entry. And the reason this pointer is necessary is because remember what I said, there may be a key collision. And when there's a key collision, what you'll have is you'll have one entry, and then you'll have a pointer to the next entry. And then that entry might have a pointer to another entry, and then so on. This is what we call a single linked list, which I'll cover in another video. The next thing we need to do in our code is actually create a function that creates the base table. And this is fairly straightforward. We create one pointer to a hash table, and then we create X number of pointers to an entry. In our case, because table size is 100,000, this will create 100,000 pointers. We will then go ahead and set all of those pointers to null. That way, when we look them up, we can just check if it's null to see if there's an entry or not. So to kind of get a mental image of our hash table so far, think of a table that has 100,000 rows and two columns. 
In column one, we have slots zero through 999,999. And then in column two, we simply have nothing at all, or more specifically, null. So to utilize our newly created htcreate function, come down to main and put ht, ht underscore create. This will give us a new hash table at variable ht. So we've created our table, we've created a hash function, we've created two structures, and now we need to actually make a way to insert a value into our hash table. Now we can do so with what we'll call the htset method. So our set function starts out by taking the hash of the given key and to find out which slot it's gonna go into. Once we know the slot, we try to find an entry at that slot. Remember, we initialized all the pointers to null. So entry in this case is going to either be null or it's going to be a valid entry. If the entry is in fact null, then this just became very easy. We simply insert a new key value pair right at that slot. Now this ht pair function is just responsible for allocating memory for the entry itself as well as the key and the value. And then it simply returns that entry. As you can see, it's just allocating memory and then copying strings in, no big deal. Now if entry is not null, it implies that one of two things has just happened. Either we've looked up a key that already exists and we must update the value, or we've encountered a collision whereby two keys are hashing to the same slot. And we can sort this out simply by walking through each of the entries until either the end is reached or we found a matching key. In the case of finding a matching key, we'll simply update the value. If we get to the end of the list, then we need to add a new entry. And this is essentially what this does. If it compares the key and it matches the current key of the entry that it's on, it simply updates the value and then just returns. Otherwise, it reaches the end of the entries and adds a new ht pair on the previous entry's next value. Now, if it does reach this line of code, then that does imply that there are now two entries at this slot. As you can probably imagine, the last function we're going to do is going to be our ht get, which is just the opposite. We're going to look up a value by a key. And this function starts out similar to the set. We start by hashing the given key, and then we start by trying to look up an entry at that given slot. If the entry is null, it means the key is not found and we're done. We simply return null and that's it. If the entry is not null, then we need to walk through one or more entries at that slot and see if we can find a matching key. If we find a matching key, we simply return the value and we're done. And then by default, if there were entries but no matching keys, then we return null because no key was found. I'm going to add one additional method called htdump, which simply loops through over our entire table and just outputs what is at every slot. This will let us visualize what our table looks like. But it's not important. It's not part of an actual hash table. It's just a helper method that I made. And then we'll go back to our main method and we'll set some values. So here I've created my hash table and then I've set name one, two, three, four, five, six, seven with the corresponding names on the right here. And then I'm gonna dump the contents of the table so we can see it in the terminal. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. So essentially what this says is at slot 24,058, we have a key value pair of name one equals em. And then the same is true for the rest. What this does show us is that there are no collisions. So let's intentionally cause some collisions. So we'll come up here and rather than having a table size of 100,000, we're gonna have a table size of three. And this will guarantee us a collision because we have seven items to store and only three slots to store them in. So let's go back to our terminal and see what it looks like now. So in this case, we have some collisions. Slot zero holds two keys, slot one holds three keys, and slot two holds two keys. So let's kind of walk through how retrieving a value from a given key would work here. So if I wanted to look up name five, name five would first be hashed and it would be hashed to slot number two, which is located here. It would then say, oh, I see an entry. So does name two equal name five? And of course that'd be false. So then it would move on. It would say, does name five equal name five? And that would be true, of course. So then it would return the value located here, which would be pyro. So let's lower our table size down to just one. And of course you would never do this because it's highly inefficient. But if we run this again, we can see that now we have one slot and everything is in that one slot. The way you can tell if your hash function is good is if you set your table size to the number of test values you're inserting into your table and then you run it, if you have the exact number of slots as you have values you've added, then you know you have a pretty good hash function. If I had any collisions in this case, I would have probably a suboptimal hash function, which I should improve. The best hash tables, of course, have no collisions. A good rule of thumb that I use is I like to keep my hash table size at about 50% larger than the number of keys it's currently storing or that I expect to store. Another option, of course, is that you can grow the size of your table as your key size grows. So you can start out with, say, 10,000 rows, and then when you get to 7,000 keys, you can grow that 10,000 to 20,000, and that will give you additional capacity to add more keys. 
And that's all there is to hash tables. Hopefully this cleared up a lot of confusion about how they work and what they're used for. If you have any additional questions or comments about what I've done here, please put them below in the comments. Other than that, I hope to see you in the next video. Take care.